This morning, we're going to go back to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, where we started really a beautiful new section uh, this, this next month we're going to be looking at, and I'm just praying that God will really use it deeply in the life of this church. And so I'm just going to read our text that we'll be looking at, and then we will go before the Lord and ask His blessing upon it. So 1 Peter 4, verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint as each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, let him speak as it were, the utterances of God, and whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to our God. Father, we come before you, and I love where this passage is going to lead us. It's going to lead us to the place where you would be glorified through Jesus Christ, and that belongs to you, the glory and dominion forever and ever. This is true. And so, God, we pray that that would be the fruit of our season together in the Word as we look at these beautiful truths that Peter penned through your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for it. I pray even this morning that you would come and you would work in power for what we look at this morning. Lord, we need greatly, we need you to awaken us. We need you to revive our hearts to the things of God. And so I pray that you would now use these supernatural words in a supernatural way and that you would take them into every mind and bring them into hearts that would bring about an active obedience for our God. And so, Lord, meet us here today as an act of worship. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Peter's writing this epistle to some saints who are suffering for the name of Jesus Christ in Asia Minor. They're being persecuted by the society that they are living in, and as a result, it's gotten so intense, they've been scattered abroad. And Peter is confident that there's more uh, suffering and persecution to come. It's just going to increase to the ultimate price of faithfulness with the shedding of his own blood and many who would be sitting and hearing this letter. Chapter 1, Peter gives us the great indicatives of grace, the statements of fact of what God has done to save a people for himself. Then he began the commandments of grace and 113 with a therefore. In light of these truths, now go live these kind of lives. How God wants them to live as aliens and strangers upon this earth. How they're to go and suffer for the sake of righteousness in the midst of this God-forsaken generation. Last time we were together in Peter, we began looking at chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, with one imperative, one command, arm yourselves then with the same purpose of Christ. And if I had to summarize that section, as Peter's saying, it's better to suffer for Christ than to sin. It's better to suffer for King Jesus than to sin and enter into this uh, uh, sin that's surrounding us in verse 3 that he's going to describe for us. Look with me. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Your time of debauchery is over. You had that when you were in Adam. You're done with that life. You've been saved from this world and its systems and its desires. You've been brought out and you've been set apart for God. And so I want you to consider then verse 3 with the section that I just read for you this morning in verses 7 through 11. In verse 3, he says, you pursued a course of sensuality and lust, and now you're focused on the good of others. <clears throat> you uh, were running around in drunkenness, 
Now you are sober-minded. You used your house for drinking parties and all kinds of immoralities. Now you're to use your home for hospitality. You used your life of self-love, and now, he says, be fervent in your love for one another. You lived for exploitation, and now you have ministries with gifts to build each other up into the image of Jesus Christ. What the gospel of 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12 has done in our lives as if we have been born again. And what you were in Adam, you are no longer, and you've now been set apart for God and His people and to be a light shining into this darkness that we've been learning in First Peter. So let's just take another glimpse then at kind of our bird's eye context of what we're going to look at, and then we'll, we'll narrow into this passage this morning. So just the big picture is we have this suffering church, and Peter starts with salvation. Angels have epithumias towards this salvation. They can't get over it and we're to never get over it. We're to marvel and, and drink this up on a daily basis, this gospel. Then he gives us a setting that it's all put in. And it's a, a persecution for righteousness' sake. And in the middle of this world that comes against us, we are to, to be a light. We are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness unto his marvelous light. So the, the setting is in a hostile world, you're aliens, but you're going to live in a way that unbelievers might come to know God because of your testimony and your life. And then he hits in chapter 4, verse 7, all the way to 511, is the second coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so the context I see is this beautiful salvation how then are we to live in society where we keep our gaze on the soon return of Jesus Christ? That's how this whole thing holds together. That's the believer's life. I, I never get over salvation while I keep looking for its consummation. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, and may it be today. And those two bookends are what are going to change. They're going to change the way you live your life today in this world. And then there's this narrowing down of chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And this could be my, my favorite section thus far in Peter, or at least until the next one. But I, this section is, is you're going to just be blown away at God's Word. And so what I want you to do is put your finger, go back to chapter 1, verse 13, and keep it in 4, 7. I want you to see the beauty of these bookends that Peter is doing for us. Look in verse 13. After him laying out the gospel, therefore, in light of the gospel, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now flip over to 4.7. <clears throat> the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit, for the purpose of prayer. And so they both are flowing out of a therefore, both 13 and 4, 7. 1, 13 is flowing out of the realities of the gospel, and Peter's saying, fix your hope on the return of Jesus Christ, the coming to you grace of God. There's a certainty to it. Fix your hope on that people. And 4, 7, it's flowing out of the second coming, but it's flowing out of his, the imminence of it that it could happen today. It's not just that there's a future hope, it's that that future hope could begin this very minute if Jesus Christ would come back. And therefore, he says, it's a call to love and prayer in the light of the nearness of Jesus Christ in this body. And so there are prerequisites to doing what follows. There's participles in verse 13. You've got to gird your minds for action and you've got to keep sober in spirit to fix your hope completely. You have to have now in verse 7, 4, 7, you've got to have sound judgment and a sober spirit to do this. And so these are the ways that we are going to stay hope-filled and focused on the unseen and what really matters, God's program. How do I not just drift and start meandering and wandering in this life? I'm going to have to gird up my mind and I'm going to have to be sober in spirit while I keep hoping on the return of Jesus Christ. And so I need you to notice what these commands all flow into. In chapter 1, they flow into be holy 
for our God is holy. And look at chapter 4, verse 2. This is what it flows into. Live the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God, for the time has already passed for you to live that way. And so they both flow into godly living. They both bring about a separation from this world. It's to call us out and live different lives. So what a beautiful context in everything that Peter has been moving us through in this epistle. One last thought, and we'll begin looking at this first verse of of 4-7. Just a general observation and one that I kind of needed answered in my own heart. As verse 7 says, the end of all things is at hand. And so you are suffering like crazy, these people receiving this, persecutions mounting and growing, and the end is almost here. It's coming. It's coming. Your hope is almost realized. And so pray. I get that in verse 7. Start praying. The end is almost here. And then he says, but love, love one another because it covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to each other without complaint. Seriously? The the end is coming and we're going to start talking about how to do hospitality and chicken soup and have people into my home? Come on, Peter. Make sure you serve one another. The end is almost here. Come on. I didn't expect that. I thought there would be something a little more triumphant. Like, the end is here. Be overcomers. You need to make it to the end. I like verse 1. Take up arms. Arm yourselves with the same purpose that Jesus Christ had. The end is at hand. Open up your homes and work on your hospitality. Figure out your spiritual gift and be sure to use it with one another. It just feels like time is almost over and that shouldn't be the float at this parade that Peter's writing about. I did not expect this out of Peter. Peter didn't seem like the hospitable kind of guy. And here he is. The end is here. Be hospitable with one another. So verse 7 begins with a a connective day. And and so how does this connect us? So the first thing we got to understand is how does this connect with verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4? How does the end of all things connect with an exhortation to love and to serve one another? How does that tie together? And then how does this whole section tie into the whole epistle of Peter, and I want to answer that before we start looking at the verse. So let's start with the, the little day, the, the but, the four in verse seven. Arm yourselves with the same purpose to suffer instead of sin, to be done with the wanton pleasures that you pursued when you were a Gentile. Your epithumia is chasing whatever you desired. Now pursue the will of God. Pursue the will of God. The end is at hand. Judgment is coming. It's around the corner. Your your hope is coming. And I don't think this exhortation is to to scare the believer, but to give you incentive, to be awake, to get after this. Jesus Christ, your bridegroom is coming. The end is near. Get, Get about the things of God. He's coming. Your bridegroom is ready to return. Paul of Jonathan Edwards, who said he lived every day as if Jesus was returning at the end of it. His return is near. His return is near. I live every day as if that return is this day. The hymn writer put it well when he said, Rise up, O men of God, and be done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of kings. Be done with lesser things. Guys, his return is at hand. Wake up. Be ready. Your bridegroom stands to return. That's the connection with verses one through six. Be done. You had your time to live in your wanton lusts and pleasures. Be done with that. Live for the will of God. And Christ is coming soon. And then second, how does the end of all things connect now with this exhortation to love and to open up your homes and serve one another? I think by answering my third question is how this ties into whole epistle will bring them together. They're seeking to win the lost by their excellent behavior. Humility and the example of suffering calmly under ridicule and reviling for righteousness sake. We spent months and months looking at that. Times are really tough 
and they're going to get tougher for Peter's group and I believe for this group. Jesus told them that it would get hard in the end days. He already warned them. It's going to get really difficult in the end of the end days. And most people's love is going to grow cold if those days weren't cut short. Isn't that a powerful statement that in the end end days, your love's going to start growing cold? He said people would get drowsy in the parable with the virgins. They're going to get sleepy. And they're going to start meandering in the Christian life and they're going to become lukewarm. And there'll be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. And it's going to get really hard and tough. And what, I think what we're seeing here is we're going to need each other. We're going to need each other to be done with this independent isolation. We're going to need each other as these days get harder and tougher. We have to pray for each other to make it to the end. And we've got to warn each other and confront one another and exhort and stimulate one another unto love and good deeds. It's going to be really hard now that the end of all things is at hand. It's going to get difficult. And what happens when the going gets tough? Maybe some moms, just even this morning, trying to get all those kids ready and dressed for church. And the kids are fighting and and they're spilling food after you just put their church clothes on and everything that's going on. It was just a nightmare to get here this morning. Maybe dads, you have a rough day at work and you come home and you had the pressures and, and your boss ripped into you and traffic was horrible and you're spent and you walk in and your wife says, here, take them, I'm, I'm done. How do those times work in your home? Multiply those by 100. And when the times get tough and the persecution begins to mount, and the enemy's tempting and people are falling away and sin is being marginalized and we're just drinking up too much of the world, you're going to get a little bit touchy and you're going to blow your stacks a little bit quicker. And when the world hates us and ridicules us and it's just flat out difficult to walk a narrow way in this day and age, we need a place to go where we are loved and safe and can renew and restore and build up one another in these days. We need to be ministered to, to put, as Hebrews said, to put the joint back in place that's been dislocated in this world. We come and we, we put that joint back in as we come into fellowship in the body of Christ. We need to be ministered to. We, we need the one another's in community so that we might be strengthened in grace. I need grace to persevere and endure these hard days. I need your gifts to grow and be edified. And I need homes that are safe when it's becoming unsafe out there. Do you see the beauty of what Peter is doing here? The end is at hand. Pray. Have a love that will begin to cover sin just rising in the testy period of what's going on. Have a hospitality without complaint. Use your gifts to build each other up into the head. It's going to get really tough. And we're going to need God in prayer. And we're going to need each other if we're going to make it. And so we get to spend the next month looking at how do we respond to each other in these end days. And we've learned how we are to respond to the world that's maligning us and and reviling us and mistreating us. We've learned how to respond to that. And now we're going to learn how to respond to one another in the church. To be these kind of lights that cause the world to glorify God on the day of their visitation because of us. We need the church. We need each other. This is not the time to check out from the church. To have Christ return in your talent that he's given to serve this body, a hidden hidden away in your basement or your busyness. To not have it hidden away in your basement or your busyness. And he's gonna come back and we have these gifts that we need in each other to make this to the end, to be built up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. The end is at hand. Draw near to God and draw near to one another. Peter's gonna teach us how to do this. And we are really when we're really stressed and really squeezed and really busy so that we will not kill each other and tear each other up and look more like the world 
than the body of Christ. But build each other up and strengthen so that we will not have to shrink back at His coming, but help each other be ready for the soon return of our bridegroom. To help each other get on our wedding clothes and be looking for that bridegroom. One of the things I always get a kick out of at weddings is just watching, you know, they help each other get dressed. I, I don't know if my house people don't do that. <laughs> but at the weddings, it's always, how's my tie look? How's my cummerbund? And the gals will help each other. And, and I'm just thinking of that going, wouldn't that be cool? Let, let's do that with each other. Let's help, you know, tie needs to be straightened out, son. Let's get together and, and make sure we're, we're dressed and we're ready for the bridegroom to come back. Amen? That's for free. That was worth the introduction. I don't care what you say. We could just close in song right now. That's, that introduction is there. Okay. So let's look at the controlling statement of this section, if you'll turn with me then to verse 7. <clears throat> verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. This is going to be what the whole section will hang on. And so Peter here is reminding his hearers, the end is almost here. Keep this in your view. And as this world squeezes you and all the pressures, realize that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed when he returns. And so let, let's do a word study. I just, there's two words that I think will help us understand what Peter's saying in this first statement. The end, the Greek word is telos. And it's a very interesting word. It's used often in the New Testament. And this word is not so much used to refer, refer to temporal or a chronological end, but this word is always used for the word, the idea of consummation. And so Peter's not focusing so much that time is about to run out. Time's about to run out, so, so get ready. But the time is about to reach its fulfillment. The consummation of all things is coming, as, as Paul said in Ephesians, the summing up of all things in Christ is at hand. It is more the idea that human history is moving to its completion. It's coming to its completion. We are in the last times. And the times from the cross to the resurrection to the ascension until Jesus Christ comes back to make all things new, we're in that last time. And so the, the history of the world, it's not cyclical. It's not just revolving events that are going to go on forever and ever and ever. It is God bringing it to its consummation. And we are coming to that point. It's moving on its trajectory that we will be brought to fulfillment in the return of Jesus Christ. And so history began with a creation. And then we move into a fall where man sins and is separated from God. And God instantly makes a promise and that I will bring about a restoration back into relationship with me. And this promise is unfolded in the scriptures. And it culminates in the Son of God coming to earth and dying on a cross and being buried and being raised. And ascension and seated at the right hand of God. And then everything since that event is moving toward this end that is at hand, the return of Christ to consummate his kingdom. Guys, that's, that's our next, that's what we're waiting for. We are longing and, and hastening and urging it. And so this is the end that Peter's talking about. When that goal is gonna be achieved, when the result is gonna be attained, the purpose consummated, fulfillment realized, the grand conclusion. And so this, guys, is at hand. It's at hand, and it's nearer than when you first believed. And so the, where God's moving everything is at hand. And I want to look at that other word, is at hand. This is just one Greek word, just one word, and it means to come near. And I want you just to listen to a couple of verses where it's, it's used. I want you to hear Matthew 26, 45. Jesus came to his disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. It's time. My time is at hand. They are coming now to arrest me and to crucify me. It is at hand. Matthew 3, 2, uh, John the Baptist, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It has come. It is, it is here in the Son of 
God. And so it's in a perfect tense, which really highlights this process being consummated with a, with a nearness. And so the best word that I could come up with is what theologians call the imminency of Christ, that His return is imminent. It is near. <coughs> the the ingathering right now of, of, the, of the nations, and there's going to be a return of Christ, uh, and it's just all that's encompassed in His return. So the, all the end times, there's a lot that's going to take place, but I'm just using that phraseology, the end times, His return. It's at hand. The believer in Christ is to live with an expectancy of the return of Christ, and we are on the eve of it. And so Peter's just kind of saying, wake up, it's at hand. The soon return of consummating all things where all of history has been moving, that you have been saved and brought into God's plan, that's almost here. It's, it's coming. It's near. 2 Thessalonians 1.10, he's going to come to be glorified in his saints and on that day to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. So this waiting is what makes us aliens in a foreign land. This world isn't my hope. It's not what I'm after. My hope is in the, the soon return of Jesus Christ. I have set my hope on the consummation of all things in Jesus Christ. This isn't it. Do we just need to hear that? This isn't our home. This isn't our hope. Our hope is in that, and, and it's at hand. It's near. This waiting is so beautiful. It's, it's, this isn't our hope or our home. We're just a passing through, right? Every generation of Christians, since Jesus Christ fixes his hope on this day, the end day is at hand. And every day is nearer than when we first believed. And it's the blessed hope of every believer here this morning. That's my hope. We're to live in a constant expectation of this day. We can't let it get away. We can't let this day let us lose sight of that day. Be ready, for you don't know the day or the hour when the Son of Man will return, said Jesus Christ. You don't know when. Peter saw him. He looked at Jesus Christ, and he saw him just taken up in the clouds. Peter got to watch that. And the angels say he's going to come back in the same way. And Peter's writing here saying it could be soon. I know it's coming. He promised it. It's coming. Set your hope on it. How front and center is this great reality upon your heart this morning? Do you hasten it? Are you looking for this day? Is the consummation of all things really your hope? When's the last time you said Maranatha even in your heart? I want you to hear this. We're in the last days of the last days. Peter will show us there are some enemies for being ready for his return. To fix your hope completely on this day, uh, the, the wartime and prayer that we need in these last days. So what do we have? Come to verse 7. We have a therefore. We have a therefore that we've been learning through help Peter. It comes out of indicatives. It comes out of realities and truths. And so here we have a therefore. The end is at hand. Therefore. So in light of guys that this is so near and it's coming, the end is at hand. Therefore, here's your response to it. There's a response that he's calling you to. And so let's look at the, their imperatives that Peter gives us. There's two of them here in verse 7. Just like in verse 13. Be of sound judgment. And be of sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. So these two commands, when they're done, so that you can pray, that you can be armed in prayer, so that you will not be playing around at prayer and just live in life without the power of God and communion of God. Let's look at the first one. Be of sound judgment. Do you remember verse 13? It said to gird your minds. And that was that garment with the loose flowing garments. And then when you go to battle, you would gird them in. And, and so he says, take all of your loose thoughts and, and gird them in and just fix your hope on Jesus Christ's return. It means to, to save your mind, to guard it, to keep it clear, uncluttered, to fix it on spiritual matters, which is what? The soon return of Christ in this context. Get your minds clear and unhindered and fixed 
on the soon return of Christ. To think about life and what you do in it and what you pursue and your goals and your purposes. He says, have sound judgment. Have sound judgment, which means to think God's thoughts then about him and this world and and sin and your life and what you're running after. Have sound thoughts. Think God's thoughts towards this world and this life. Think his thoughts that he's coming. Have that in your thinking and how you work it out day to day. Colossians says, set your affections, your minds on the things above. Set them there. Do not be swept away by your passions and your emotions as we saw in verse 3 and 4 of chapter 4. Let me read you a couple verses where this word is used and I think it will help us understand it better as well. In Mark 5, there there was a, a demoniac. And he, he's, he's being bound with shackles and he keeps bursting these chains and everything they put on him. And he's going about, it says, crying out and gashing himself with stones. He's, he's out of his mind. And it says no one could subdue him anymore. It's a fearful place to even go by this guy. And Jesus comes by and there are demons in the man and they, they're, they're called legion. And Jesus casts them out and they say, throw us into the herd of swine. And he puts them in the swine, and the swine run off the cliff, and they're drowned. And all the people now, they're, they're hearing of this, and they come. And I want you to listen to verse 15. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his, here's the same word, his right mind. The very man who had the legion, and they became frightened because of it. So here a man who was out of his mind, crazy and insane. And now he's seated at the feet of Jesus in his right mind because now everything's in perspective. Seated at the feet of Jesus Christ is the place of right-mindedness. Just sit, seated there in my right mind, seeing the fullness and the beauty of all that Jesus Christ is. And then when I preached in Titus 2, I want you to hear this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us, here's what salvation does. So 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12, and here's what it does. It instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What are we doing? Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So there's both advents, and he gave himself for us. Why? Why? that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. To to have right thinking and right-mindedness in between these advents, uh, rejecting the the sins and the passions of this world, you're to be set apart, uh, being zealous for good deeds for our God. Acts 26, 25, Paul said, I'm not out of my mind. Uh, uh, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. I speak with a, a sound mind and I speak the truth. So please get this. We live in a world that lies in the lap of the evil one and its system, the cosmos. It's very easy to lose your spiritual mindedness in this world. Everything is preaching the opposite of sound-mindedness. Only the Word of God preaches contrary to it. It's very easy to get lost in this, to think naturally like all the people around us, to, to live as if this world is our end. You can get swept up in that current so easily that there's no consummation of all things. I'm done looking at that, to, to build a, a fortress right here. And to start making this your your city, your refuge, and your home. You can do that really easily. I was thinking about that this week. I saw one time when I was first saved, there was a guy holding a sign. I think it was at Mile High Stadium back when the Broncos played there. And it said, the end is at hand. And everyone who walked by mocked him and ridiculed him and reviled him. And they said, they said, he's out of his mind. That guy's out of his mind. But the one who knows that the end is at hand has sound judgment in his right mind. So the right-mindedness is to know that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. The insane mind mocks that. 
and acts and ridicules it. In 2 Peter, they mock him going, where is this return? We've heard this forever. And he says, don't you know that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years? So it's only been two days to the Lord since he said the end is near. So be of sound mind and think truthfully about God and others and sin and salvation and Christ and his return. Don't get swept away by this world and the antichrist thinking of this world. Don't get swept away in it. The end times, Christ said, you're gonna, it's easy to get swept away in what's going on around us. The apostasy that we're all sitting in and watching on a daily basis has it got into your own heart this morning. John MacArthur said, this is a balanced, disciplined, God-controlled thinking to think God's thoughts about life through this word. Secondly, to be of a sober spirit. Same word in verse 13 of chapter one. And so be sober. What, what, what happens to a drunk? He, he, he wobbles. He can't even walk straight. He starts to slur his speech. He, he tells you that he means that you're his very best friend. You can't drive straight. Everything he says is regretted in the morning. And this is what will happen to us, he says, in the end days. We will become spiritual drunks. In those last days, we're going to be spiritual drunks. We, we will drink in this world and all of its lies and, and no moderation is preached by this world. And money and power become your end game. Everything is about your kingdom. And the, it could be that children become your very life. Moms, you could be drunk this morning spiritually because all you can think about is these kids and your life is tied to them and your identity is them and you can't even walk a straight spiritual line because these kids uh, have taken away your epithumia of your heart, your house and your vacation home. The, the whole goal of making a reputation for myself can make you drunk spiritually cars, where it's just all I can focus on is my hot rod and my cars and getting Mercedes and all the best. All I can think about is cars. I, I, all I want is if I could have a girlfriend, I'll do anything to have a girlfriend or a boy, boyfriend. And I don't care what the Bible says. It, that, that's out the window because that's all I can think about. You're just drunk, just drunk looking for your boyfriend or girlfriend. Entertainment. Social media, I've seen more people get drunk on CNN, just spending all their time watching it, fearful, just no view of Christ, and you're spiritually drunk, taking in all of that garbage. It can be exercise, Netflix binging will make you drunk spiritually, sports, being a foodie, sci-fi novels, Pornography, I've never seen someone look more spiritually drunk than someone addicted to pornography. They lose all of the awareness of anyone around them and they're just lost and dazed. If, if anyone's lost in any of these sins and drunk, I, I pray that you'll seek out an elder to be led out of these sins. You're, you're drunk spiritually. There are many kinds of alcohols out there. There's all these new microbrews and beer brands and everything. But there are so many kinds of spiritual alcohols out there to make you drunk spiritually. When you are so dry and cold and numb to the soon return of Christ, that in a spiritual things, you're just like a drunk. You're spiritually inebriated and you can't walk a straight line that the word of God calls you to. You have no urgency or imminency for the return of the Son of Man. In fact, if you were honest, you'd be fine if he didn't come back for 20 years, maybe 40. You speak of the return of oh, Christ oh, with a yawn. John Piper said this. He said, every day I walk into my office and there's a desk. And on, at this desk is where I work and where I write and where I study. And over here is a, a place that it's my prayer closet. And that's where I go and I sing to God and I talk with him. And he said, every time I walk in there, there's a tug 
to go to my desk that's enormous because I got stuff to do. I'm an American. <laughs> we produce and we, we do things. We don't pray. I'm drunk, he said, with the spirit of the age that we accomplish. And I got slurred speech and can't even walk. But we cover it up with awards and suits and buildings and portfolios to look good, but we're drunk. And so this morning, I'm just praying for any of you that are inebriated spiritually, that God would just snap us out of it this morning and wake us up. The, the end is at hand, and we're drunk on the things of this world. And we just, there's no heart or longing or hastening for what this is all about. Let's put it like this, maybe to explain the last point. If you don't want to pray, you're drunk with the world. Your prayer life will show if you're drunk with the world or if you're alert and ready and alive for the soon return of Christ. Be of sound mind, back to verse 7. Be of sober spirit, why? For the purpose of prayer. For the purpose of prayer, get get. Get sober again in your spirit and have God's thoughts towards life and truth and his return and all of these things. Keep it. Keep those truths in there so that you can pray. <laughs> We're going to need a prayer life in these last days like never before. We need to be communing with our God. We need to be living in a relationship with him and drinking it up like a like a. 1 Peter 2, 4, coming to him, thirsting, drinking again and again. I need him. Just me and God, hand in hand, walkie-talkie. God, I need help here. There's a battle over here. Send in reinforcements. And, and the, the word for prayer here is in the plural. It's not one prayer. <coughs> All day long, I'm praying. I, I, I have to stay sober and, and in touch with this relationship with God. Apart from him, I can do nothing. And I just live praying, looking, depending, communing, hand in hand. The end is the end's coming. And I, I'm going to be holding your hand, God, when you come back. I'm going to be in intimacy and dependency and prayer and fellowship with my God. We look to him for all things. To not be hindered with a cluttered and balanced mind. Do you hear that? A cluttered and balanced mind. <clears throat> to where your prayer life is like a drunk slurring and chasing any thought that pops in my head. I can't even keep a straight thought because I'm so drunk with this world. I can't even pray because my mind wants to think about all the stuff I've been drinking of this world all week long. You can't even have communion with God because you've drank all this stuff up. So the question is, could that be one of us this morning? The pressures and the goals that you're chasing have made you drunk, drunk to where you can't even pray any longer. You don't even know what the secret place is anymore. This is so clear to me. The world conforms you into its image and it gets your thinking and your affections and thus your will. And you just have an endless barrage of false hopes in this world. Communion with God is lost and you lose the kind of life that we have been studying in this epistle. And no one, no one ever will ask you, what is the hope within you? They'll never look at you and say, what's the hope within you? Because you're just a spiritual drunk and they don't see it. You're dismissed like the drunk on the corner. You just oh, don't, don't listen to them. And they'll say the same thing about you. Oh, don't, don't listen to all that babbling. Or your life is so drunk, you can't even think clear thoughts about the gospel to bring to bear to those you come in contact with. It's not even on your mind. It's not even on your radar. I don't even think about it. Guys, let's be so gripped with the return of Christ, who's for the consummation of all things, that we have our spiritual wits about us. A sound mind in this word and thinking God's thoughts. And a sober spirit that isn't drunk with all these things of this world. Praying, communing with our God in real vital prayer in these days. And I want you to listen to 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Paul says, Timothy, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. 
I have fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. And I want to ask you that. Do you love his appearing? Is that the the joy and the love of your heart? Come, Lord Jesus. I'm not just, oh, I hope it comes one day. I love the appearing of Christ. Nothing could make me happier than the return of Jesus Christ. Are you drunk? Do you need some coffee? Next week, we're going to begin to look at what this will bring about, this sober thinking and and, and clear-mindedness and hoping in the return of Jesus Christ. And it's gonna be radical what he calls us to. And I'm gonna ask you, if you have never entered in to love of the brethren, to hospitality, to using your gifts, that you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're spiritually drunk and he's gonna come back and, and it isn't gonna be a, a joyful recon, reconciliation. You're gonna have to deal with this. And Peter's gonna call, call us to wake up, sober up, And these things, I'm not just pressing them because I've got a hobby horse. I'm pressing them because this is what Peter's gonna say. With this end coming, this is what you better be about. This is what you better be giving your life to. And don't be drunk on other lesser things of this world. Give yourselves to greater things. Be done with lesser things and give heart and mind and soul and voice to serve the King of Kings. Amen? Amen. Rough passage. Uh, My guess is all of us I might have had a few too many spiritual drinks. And I'm praying that God will bring revival in our hearts and every one of us to say, I'm done wobbling spiritually. I'm done with that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna anchor in because the end is at hand. And, and we're gonna help each other get dressed and be ready for the bride. Father, I pray that your spirit would work in every heart. I pray don't let this word bounce off. Don't let us run to to go get a spiritual drink because it hurt us. God, I pray, let nothing, let no one take away the bullet of God from this word apart from just loving the appearing of Jesus Christ. Making that the ultimate chief end, consummation of everything that we're looking for, running towards, hoping in. God, would you fix our eyes as we look back and remember all that you did in Christ. And look forward to all that you will do in his second coming. God, I thank you for a gospel. I thank you for how beauty it is. And it just makes me want to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. God, I want to be sober. I want to live sober in light of these realities and these truths. I want them to guide me and drive me and rule me and reign me. God, I pray for every heart. Let repentance flow from our hearts. Any one of us who are drunk spiritually this morning, God, bring us to repentance. Help us to quit drinking lesser things. God, lift us from it. Set us free. Put our hearts on the only thing that matters. God, I pray that you will do that work in this body and that we will remember this Sunday for years to come when you set us free and sobered us up. God, every one of our hearts just on the right thing. And we'll begin to see a love that will flow like nowhere else. And our homes will break open to each other and to the world, to strangers. And it'll just be burst open. Lord, break our doors open and then take our gifts and let us pour into each other. Thank you for gifts. Thank you that you spiritually imparted them into us. God, let us quit sitting on them and use them. Use them for the the name that is above every name. Please come back, even this day, Lord Jesus. Finish, consummate everything, bring history to a close. Let it be this night. There's nothing I want more than that. Come. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.